Also, we've got New Zealand, uh, Cuba happening early next year, and then um, Indo happening a little bit later in April. So we've got some exciting things. But um, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pray for New Zealand in a little bit, as I said. I just wanted to, uh, firstly, I know we get up every week and we pray for tithes and offerings. I just wanted to spend a moment before we pray this morning, uh, just telling you why we pray and give give you two reasons there there are probably a a, a few more but firstly I want to say this you know we get up and we pray for a thousand offerings not because we want to twist people's arms to to give it's not about um going you know come on guys give it it's it's first and foremost about praying to thank the Lord for his provision he provides its reliance on him as a church, we rely on him for, for everything. It's not as soon as it becomes about our own uh, ability, our own capabilities of, of doing things, we've, we've missed the boat. And just to add on to that, I'll say this is why we also pray corporately. It's so that we can rely on him and his grace rather than do our own thing and our own strength. And we, we really believe the importance of prayer for reliance on Him. And that's why we pray on a Sunday morning and most Friday off, uh, Friday evenings. Um, so we're a church that prays. Now, this, the second thing that I want to raise your attention, why we pray for tithes and offerings, is because we, we pray for people's hearts. And um, in Luke 18, uh, Jesus is approached by this rich, uh, rich ruler. And he comes and approaches Jesus and he says, what must I do to uh, be able to get into heaven? And Jesus says, you remember the, the commandments, right? Do not steal, do not uh, commit adultery. Uh, you know, those commandments. Um, and then he says to Jesus, yeah, I, I've kept all of those. Um, and Jesus says, the one thing that you haven't done, uh, I command you to go and sell up everything that you've got and give it to the poor. And he went downcast, walked away downcast. And what Jesus was addressing here is heart attitude. We pray for people's heart attitudes. Um, And actually Jesus goes on to say, you know, uh, how sad or how hard it is for uh, the wealthy to enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for for um, rich people. And that's not saying it's you, you. You can't be rich, but what it is addressing is that if you if you're holding on to wealth with a tight hand, that's not. Not what, what Jesus asks of us. He wants us to hold things with open hands and our open hearts. And so that's why we pray. So we're going to pray for that this morning, if, you, if you'll join me. Father, thank you. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for what you uh, do in our lives. Thank you for providing all our needs. Uh, Lord, as you say, uh, your word says, do not worry about your life. Do not uh, worry about what you eat or drink or wear. Father, thank you that you provide for us as a church and as a people, Lord. Father, we pray for our hearts this morning. Um, we pray, Lord, that uh, we may be able to uh, hold with open hands uh, everything uh, because it is yours, Lord. Thank you. We pray for open hearts this morning. Amen. Right, now I'd like to invite Peter and, and Rudy up because we would like to pray for them as a church before they leave for New Zealand this afternoon. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, while, while they're in New Zealand, uh, Rudy and Peter are going to go to three churches. Uh, first is Cliff and Nova Cherries, uh, Point Church in Hastings, New Zealand. Second one, Bruce and Sandy de Haas, Solid Ground Church, Masterton, New Zealand. And then Elmarie and Ross Colby, North Base Church, Wellington. So Wellington, obviously a massive city. Uh, which, there was one church you mentioned that's got about 500, 500 people. Is that the Wellington Church? No. 
That's Cliff and Cherry's. Okay, all right. But um, really exciting. Um, a big part of our prayer meeting this morning was was praying for these guys, and the words that came out uh, were along the lines of addressing uh, foundational uh, things in the church. And I think it's so apt with what we've been talking about in terms of Nehemiah building the wall but we've got to build off the chief cornerstone being Jesus. And so just like Peter also spoke about, um, you know, Jesus uh, will build his church off the revelation of who he is. And so we're going to pray that over these guys this morning. Can you, would you mind standing with me and praying with us this morning? Maybe some people that have been to the nations can come. Yeah, uh, if, if you've been to the nations and you really have a heart to, to pray with these guys this morning, please come up and, and lay hands on them. I'm Colin, Colin, Colin Malden. You've been talking to me about God's been stirring your heart, but. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, it's running away. <laughs> oh, Lord, this morning, um, we thank you. It's all been about your presence and who you are, Lord. Mm. It's mm. about the revelation of who you are and you building your church, mm. Lord. Yeah. We want to pray that over these guys this morning as they uh, prepare to go over to New Zealand. Uh, may they go over and declare um, who you are um, and knowing, knowing you and knowing you uh, crucified, Lord. Uh, we pray, Father, uh, that as they share your word and share your ways, Lord, um, they may uh, be pointing um, the leaders of these ch uh, churches to the chief cornerstone, which is you, Lord. May they, um, whatever they speak and the words that they sow, uh, may they all be directly uh, pointed to you and, and mm. how you building your church, Lord. Mm. Amen. 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 Peter, as you go, I pray for a download of the word of faith. Mm. Not your words or from your experience, <coughs> but only from the experience of the Word of God and the experience of the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Mm. Father, I pray that his voice, his strength, his ability, all, all of his being will be conformed by your being, Father. Mm. Holy Spirit, come, fill the temple. Yeah. Fill it, O oh God, hmm. that as he speaks, rivers of living water, words that you won't know, Peter, but they will break through hard ground and the new seed will be planted. Speak forth the prophetic word in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that um, as they answer that great commission of go to the nations, Lord, that all the pressure is on you, Lord, not on them. Father, that it's you, it's by the might and the power of your Holy Spirit indwelling them, uh, literally giving them the words to speak, Lord, that you going to establish the work of their hands, Lord. They don't have to do anything in their own strength, but God, it's all on you. And so, Father, we pray that you fill them to the full double portion with the anointing of your Holy Spirit this morning, that you go before them, that you come behind them, that you be on every side of them, Lord, everywhere that they put their foot, Lord. We thank you that you go before them. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray that as um, Rudy and Pete go, Lord, that your the seeds that they sow, you would water and that you would ready the ground for, um, that you would soften the hearts of people to receive them and that as they go with joy and, and build those friendships and relationships, Lord, that, that what they speak will be received and put into practice, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would water what is sown. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Just last thing I'll say, and I said this to you guys praying this morning, don't leave prayer for these guys 
just over here this morning. I think uh, during the week and during uh, quiet times um, and while they're over there, please pray for them. And if, if a word comes to mind, a word of encouragement, drop, drop them a text. They're still going to have their phones and things with them. Wow, Queensland, Queensland. Come, Pete and Deb. Queensland. Queensland's never going to be the same again. Sorry? Yeah. So, some of you know this, but um, we moved to Lorikeet Street in 1994. And we've been in the street about renting uh, in the street about a month or so, and there's a knock on the door, and it's Mr. Jackson. So I said to him, oh, where are you from? He said, I'm from across the road, and I heard that you lead a church, and, and, uh, and I think we had like 10 people and two dogs in the church, maybe a cat. We just arrived in the town, and uh, we just started the church, in fact. And uh, I said to him, you have a lousy accent, trying to just connect with him, because I knew straight away, as soon as he opened his mouth, he's Zimbabwean. Zimbabweans have a beautiful accent. They really do. I mean that sincerely. And anyway, he stayed for tea, invited himself. No, no, I, I invited him. I said, where's your wife? And he said, oh, she's in Queensland and uh, visiting uh, relations, and I said, well, why don't you come over for tea? So uh, that's how the relationship started 20 or 27 years ago. So, and now you're leaving us, Pete and Deb. Pete and Deb, what a blessing you've both been. Uh, I'd like to say that publicly. People say, people that have mentored me over the years says, one said, don't make too many promises and declarations, but I'd like to declare that over you both. You, you've just been a blessing to the church. And I think the way you're leaving is the biblical way. You come in through the gates, the gates, the elders sat at the gate, the Proverbs 31 woman's husband sat at the gate. He was an elder. You come into a church through the eldership, and then when you leave, you go out through the eldership. This is the way to go out. Not disappearing and just drifting off into the night and not even sending a text message saying, thanks for 10 years. Happens in every church right across the nations. Well done. Well done. Can we stand and bless these people? We gave them a gift the other night and... Uh, and if you've you. got a gift for, for them, uh, then please see them afterwards, and Deb will give you uh, her BSP and account number. <laughs> Pete can't remember it. Uh, but you might want to say something, Deb or Pete, before you go. You, can you get up on the step? Because On the step. Yeah, oh, okay. just so we can see you. We're on live <laughs> stream. So. Um, I think we leave here with a grateful heart a really grateful heart. Um, so many years of being loved, of being loved. And I don't say that lightly because we live in a world where there's so many people who are lonely and feel unloved. And the privilege we have as Christians, really, to be loved by a, a perfect God, even though we are so imperfect ourselves and we mess up. And I just want to, yeah, just say thank you for the love over many, many years with Rudy and Wendy, the eldership, um, the friends that we've made that I hope and I know will continue in Toowoomba, I know, and I just want to say thanks to God um, for each one of you and the many over the years who I just want to honour. Yeah. And I stand here today and I honour Wendy's mum, Nana Coral, who was a grandmother to my children because we had no family here. So I honour her today, Coral, and Nana Peg, those of you who remember, but those who've gone before, who are incredible family to us when we didn't have family. And that meant yeah. so much to me, to Peter, and to our children. 
So thank you really from the bottom of my heart. I really, really mean that, that we have felt so loved. Yeah. And I love Wendy so much and you too, Rudy. We will miss you so much. If we get elders as good as you guys, we'll be so blessed, really. I hope we get someone like your calibre. I really mean that when wow. we're in our new Thanks. church. Thank you. Um, obviously, I agree with Deb there. Thanks for being family. Um, this Deb was from, from, was from Australia. I came over from well, Zimbabwe and South Africa, so... We needed family, so we appreciate that. Um, and being there when we adopted in the early days, that really was, we needed that um, kind of support. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm very thankful to you, Rudy, that you've got a church that models the charismatic, mm. the, the prophetic, the uh, apostolic, because mm. there's a slight difference. We've been in... Um, Really had been in the street about six months when I heard there was a Christian, not a leader, church leader. So I just went to encourage this Christian up the street. But God had been working on me for eight months about leaving the church we were in. Not that I thought really it would be the one. Uh, but uh, we're yeah, we we're glad he was because yeah. I, I opened me up where I, what, I could move in the giftings which God had planned for me but it had been kept away because I hadn't got a church that modelled it. So that opened me up, and mm. from that I've been able to move into that new area, mm. which really knows that mm. I mean, I've been uh, practising it for what it was 24, 25 years now. Yeah, good. So yeah. I really appreciate that you opened that up to me mm. um, and Great. been at home. Great. And your encouragement over the time. Sure. When we had some interesting... Uh, dips in the way. It's a pleasure. Well, Father, we, we thank you for this precious... Come, Dal, come lay your hands on this lady. And thank you. Father, we thank you as a church that you died for the church. Christ died for the church. And that you only have a plan A, there's no plan B. And we thank you for these precious people, the Ecclesia, uh, that joined us almost from our inception 27 odd years ago and are leaving today. Father, we know we go from glory to glory. That's, you're a good, good father, and you take us from one point of strength to the next. So we pray they go actually, actually go up a, up a cog, uh, up a gear, in their Christian walk in the new church in Toowoomba. We, we send them off with our blessing this morning as a church, and we speak life and, and wholeness and healing and reconciliation. And, Lord, we, we pray your love, the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, might keep them every day. Now, to him who's able to keep you from falling, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God. Be honor, be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you both. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Amen. Great. Can you turn with me to the book of Nehemiah? And uh, we've been looking at Nehemiah for some weeks now. We'd like to welcome you online. Um, thank you for joining us. We appreciate you clicking on and uh, finding us. Uh, over the past few weeks, for those of you that aren't aware, but for the past few weeks, We've had Nehemiah's life under the microscope and drawn many, many parallels with Nehemiah's life. We've drawn parallels to the life of Jesus himself. So, <clears throat> quick summary, we've, we've asked ourselves, it's Nehemiah chapter 1, we've asked ourselves uh, in the last three, four weeks, what are you building in life? Because every day you and I 
write our own job description by the decisions that we make. So what are you building? We addressed that some weeks ago. We talked about what is Jesus building. Uh, he's definitely not building a pile of, of rubble, but rather carefully cut, cutting and polishing living stones. Peter put it this way, Peter the Apostle, like living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Christ being the cornerstone, we learned that the cornerstone is the first stone in a building. It's the first stone so that everything that is built after that has to align with the cornerstone and with him. Otherwise, what you build will be faulty. We talked around the fact that if you're, you know, the golden calf in your house, your kids don't touch the golden calf. Well, let's just talk about family. If your family or your career or your profession or your relationships have become the cornerstone, i.e., you start aligning your life after all of those things, you're building wrong, according to the Scriptures. Jesus is our cornerstone. And then we align our life after laying the cornerstone in our life. We align everything that comes after that, after his life. Otherwise, we're building a faulty building. We learned that we're the house. Uh, Hebrews 3 talks about that, that we're the house that God is building. We also spoke about how to protect what we've built. Uh, have a listen to Ryan's great preach from that last week where he spoke around how to protect what we've actually built. Now, today we're going to look at who are you building with? Who are you building with? You know, it's a tried and tested fact that the people you surround yourself with will determine how far you go in life. Uh, we have a, a phrase that's coined in the church, um, who do you want to do life with? Good question to ask. If it's just religion, then you'll just turn up and sit on a plastic chair and you'll go home. That's religion. You've, you've ticked that box and you're done. You're done for the week. But if it's, if it's true, vibrant, New Testament Christianity, then you'll make sure that you do life with the right people. Now, for all of you here, you've landed here. We trust that you stay. But ultimately, you're either our sheep or you're not. I remember speaking to a pastor in, uh, in Warrnambool years ago, and he said he'd stand at the door of the, of the church and as people would leave, and I don't do this because I did it in the early years, and I stood there by myself because everyone stayed here yakking. And I thought, well, that's a waste, so I don't do it. I haven't done it for 20 years. But he said he'd stand at the door and shake people's hands, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And then he'd say in his heart, definitely our sheep. Oh, there's Mr. Smith, not our sheep. Uh, oh, here's, the, uh, here's Robin and so-and-so, uh, definitely our sheep. And then possibly the, the people behind, possibly our sheep. He said, as a shepherd, I could tell who was our sheep and who wasn't. My sheep, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. See, if you want to go far in life, then if you want to, in fact, go fast in life, then you go alone. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, then go together. Jesus sent out his apprentices two by two. Nothing has changed in two millennia. If you want to change your ecosystem, you can't do it alone, especially when it comes to 
the kingdom of God. So we've looked at a cameo of this guy called Nehemiah, a cupbearer to the king. Just quick summation, a man with a job that had all the perks and privileges that came with working in the royal court alongside the king and, and his queen. Nehemiah was used to designer clothes, imported foods, fine wines, serving guests of the king from countries all around the world. Nehemiah was privy to stimulating and intelligent conversation. He was across the politics of the day, and he knew by sheer instinct who was for the king and who was just playing the game. He was in that inner circle. He was the king's cupbearer. Little did Nehemiah realize that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was preparing him in the king's court, was preparing him for God's assignment, a kingdom assignment that would be talked about thousands of years later, you and I doing just that. Uh, he was surrounded by different actors uh, all involved in his life in some way. But Nehemiah's playbook, like the Hall of Famer Noah, who built the ark, regardless of the challenges Noah faced, regardless of the challenges that Nehemiah faced, he remained resolute. He stuck to his guns, so to speak. He stayed on the wall, and eventually Nehemiah finished the job. Love that. Nehemiah was a visionary. A visionary is someone who builds for the next generation, not just this generation, the next generation. You see, vision generates direction, order, and devotion. It overcomes aimlessness, chaos, and lawlessness. You see, having clear purpose will get you out of bed each morning. Our assignment is found in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 to 8. And in the Message Bible, it says this, tell people, Jesus says, tell people the message of heaven and that it's here. Another uh, translation says, the tell people that the kingdom of heaven is nigh. Bring health to the sick, raise the dead, touch the untouchables, kick out the demons. You've been treated generously, so live generously. People's lives are broken, and they're waiting for someone to at least announce, hey, the kingdom of heaven is near you. That's God's righteousness, peace, and joy. You see, people think that the kingdom of heaven is unobtainable. You see, religion will tell you that, that exact thing. It's unobtainable. However, that all changed on the arrival of the master builder, Jesus, simply because of the cross. Jesus through the cross, through his death, through laying down his life. No one took his life from him. He said, no one takes my life from me. From me, I lay it down freely. He built a bridge to the Father. So now we can reach the Father, our Father. That's why we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed to be, to be reverence is your name. That's only possible. You, 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 you recite that prayer outside of the kingdom, not knowing Jesus, not having a circumcised heart, it's just recitation. But when you, when you speak the Our Father prayer, when you know Jesus, it's truly your Father in heaven, my Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, etc., Jesus built that cross, uh, that bridge through the cross for us to reach God. I said before that Nehemiah's job prepared him for his future. 
God is preparing us for our future. Never discount the job that you're doing right now as God has a plan and purpose in it. Remember those weighty words of Mordecai as he spoke to Esther and he declared over Esther, Esther, listen up. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows, Esther, whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Esther 4 verse 14. You see, Nehemiah was on an assignment given to him from heaven. You see, I never knew in all my years, I never knew what the Holy Spirit had in his heart for us as a young family when we drove into Mount Gambia in January 1995. In two months' time, we'll be at 28 years. We drove into Mount Gambia late one evening, Saturday evening, Simone was 11, Uh, Renee was, she just turned 13. We arrived here having never visited the town before. Um, There was no Siri or internet, so we found the safest place in town, so we slept in our car outside Mount Gambia Police Station. Couldn't find a motel. Little did I realize that if you drive along uh, uh, the highway, there's 20 hotels. You see, heaven has an important assignment for all of us if we'll just be obedient to the promptings, to his promptings. You see, our success in life can be measured on how many times we say yes to Jesus. Oh, you say, I've been hurt in the past by leaders and churches. Well, so was Jesus on a constant basis. Paul the Apostle put up one of his detractors' names up in lights for everyone for the next two millennia to read. He put the guy's name up in lights. His name was Alexander, the tradesman. Alexander, who, the coppersmith, the tradesman who gave Paul curry for years. His name's up in lights forever. Everyone's been hurt. But here's the thing. Like Nehemiah, Jesus never got off the wall. Because in life, instead of looking for people to give you a bouquet of flowers, you say, I'm just looking for people to be nice. Well, we heard a minute ago that people have been nice, and what a, that's, that's a blessing. But instead of waiting for people to give you a bouquet of flowers, just grow your own garden. Encourage yourself constantly. See, Paul was able to zoom out and keep his head in all situations, and he reminded his readership in Corinth, deliberately keeping life plain and simple. He says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2, he says, first Jesus and who he is, Then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. Your Bible probably reads like this. I came to find out nothing about you but Christ and him crucified. Keep it simple. You'll keep your mental health when you keep it simple. Jesus is king. His kingdom is primary. And while we keep it uttermost in our hearts and minds, Other stuff like people's unrealistic expectations. Churches are full of unrealistic expectations. It'll just roll off your back. Stay on the wall. Stay on the wall. You show maturity. Nehemiah was, he had soft hands. Some of you alpha males sitting here, you shake Nehemiah's hand, you think, Oh, a bit of a wet fish, mate. <laughs> Nehemiah had soft hands. He served food and fine wines and nice designer clothes. He had the latest gear. You have to dress up standing in front of the king. 
Not jeans with holes in it. Get your head chopped off. I'm using creative license. <laughs> Nehemiah, soft hands. My point is this. It doesn't matter what trade, profession you're in right now, God will use you. He just wants an obedient heart. So who did Nehemiah build with? I told you God had supported. He says in Nehemiah 2 verse 18, if you haven't found Nehemiah now, give it away. You'll never find it. Nehemiah 2 verse 18, he says this, and I quote, I told him how God was supporting me and how the king was backing me up. They said, this is to the people on the wall when he arrives in Judah or in Jerusalem. The people respond as follows. We're with you. Let's get started. They rolled up their sleeves, ready for the good work. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 18. In life, find similar-minded people. We're with you. Let's get started. They rolled up their sleeves, ready for the good work. I love the fact in Nehemiah 2.18, every translation says it's a good work. You see, when God's challenged and changed your heart, you see things through kingdom lenses. You don't see it, you don't see fellowship as a task. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you lived in Adelaide, we lived in Adelaide for eight years. It was 40 minutes to church. 40 minutes every week, twice on a Sunday, morning and evening meeting. We used to have a prayer meeting 7 o'clock Saturday morning. The pastor of our church, I realized afterwards, because I was pretty thick, I didn't quite get it initially, he was growing an army. That church planted churches all over the nations, over Australia, here in Mount Gambia. He wasn't treating us with kid gloves like, oh, shame. Oh, oh my goodness, you have to drive 10 minutes? Oh, someone picked them up. He was growing an army. Seven o'clock Saturday morning. Are you kidding me? I worked as a financial accountant. I was finished on a Friday night. Get up at, at 6 o'clock with two little girls. They used to come to prayer. Our girls would come to prayer in their PJs. They'd come to prayer in their PJs, praying. 7 o'clock, 7 till 8. And it was 7 till 8 because a lot of guys came to the prayer meeting and went straight to work, those that work Saturdays. And initially I thought, wow, this is... Little bit of mm, little bit of legalism. And I realized, no, you've got the wrong lenses on, son. You need to grow up a little bit. The man is preparing an army. This man's a Nehemiah. He sees there's walls to be rebuilt. People's walls, lives are are shot, they smashed. The gates, the entry to their lives are burnt with fire. Well, you and I are living in a time, 2022, man, we're living in dark days, people. Come on. People's lives are smashed. So we'd pray seven till, and 40 minutes, so you leave home. Hop past six, you're rounding up the posse. Come on. And in their pajamas, you know, still on the toilet, and get and in the car and... 20 to 7, we're driving to a prayer meeting on a Saturday morning. Wow. But he's building an army. So who did Nehemiah build, build with? He built with people who had an attitude of, let's get started. We're with you. They rolled up their sleeves. I'm quoting scripture. They roll, rolled up their sleeves ready for the good work. You see, don't try and stop trying to change people's minds. Look for people's minds who are already changed and transformed. They said to Nehemiah, we're with you. Let's get started. 
You see, unity will always attract heaven's attention. Psalm 133 attests to that. It says, and I quote, Behold, behold, look, look, behold how good and beautiful it is, how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It's something, unity is something, unity of purpose is what Nehemiah had on the wall. It's something worth checking out. It's something worth joining and investing in. You see, because of their attitude, the people that surrounded Nehemiah, because of their attitude to rise up and build, they actually declared this is a good work. It's something worth investigating and investing in. Nehemiah was familiar with human nature. He hung around all in the courts, the royal courts. He hung around prime ministers and presidents and kings and queens. Mighty men coming back from battle. Nehemiah knew about it. He was familiar with human nature. He was seen the best and the worst in the king's court. Equally, Jesus gave us a window into human nature as well. When he healed the ten lepers, and the next day, only one returned to thank him. And he asked the one leper. He said, weren't there there ten of you? Where's the rest of your friends? Leper said, I don't know. The grateful leper came back. He came back to thank him. In life, live grateful. Be the one who will be the one that goes the extra mile. Regardless of what it may cost you, as you live in the tension of I'm doing this for the king and the kingdom. You do it for the church or for the pastor or for someone else, I'm telling you eventually you'll bail out. Because all they have to do is say something that you think, you haven't had a good day, haven't had a good week, and then someone from the church says something, you think, that's not nice. If you're doing it for the king, you take it to the king, you say, Jesus, that was a little bit below the belt. But Jesus, I'm doing, I'm not doing it for him or her, I'm doing it for you. Nehemiah just he was slaughtered. He was slaughtered verbally. He constantly, you go through the book of Nehemiah, uh, eight or nine chapters, thereabouts, he constantly was criticized. Get off the wall. This is rubbish. How dare you come from another city and come and speak to us? I was told in my early years here, a lady sat opposite me. We lived in Power Street. She sat opposite me. She said, oh, you're from Adelaide. I said, that's correct, lady. I knew it was coming because the oxygen had left the room. When she walked in, the oxygen left the room. She came in, oxygen went out. You've got to live prophetically, people. You can't get caught out. She said, you're an accountant in Adelaide. I said, yes, ma'am, guilty as charged. She said, that'd be right, because you're definitely not a pastor. And she got up, turned around, walked out. If you're doing it for people, you'd crawl up and, and in the feet, cry in the fetal position. No, we, Nehemiah was in Judah. He was back in Jerusalem. His old city, his old stamping ground. He was there because he received an assignment from God. You and I are saved. We, we washed. We, we clean. It doesn't matter how you feel. We're all into our feelings these days. Well, I feel. No, it's what the Bible says about you. Not your feelings. They come and go. People criticize you. You don't fall back and go back into, oh, and I, I'm out. I'm, no, that's for babies. That's what babies do. You take away their toy, they stamp, and then they're out. <laughs> Remember when we, oh, no, I better not tell that story. Renee will kill me. <laughs> Look at life. Look at what you're involved in in the kingdom. Look at through kingdom lenses. 
not selfish ones. God has clear purposes for all of us. I love what Philippians 1, 6 says. Philippians, uh, Paul says to the Philippian church, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion or to fruition at the day of Jesus Christ. It's a good work, folk. What you're involved in is in people's lives. It's a good work. See, when you're not walking by faith, however, You'll question everything that the word proclaims. You see, if you, lose, if you lose respect for this here, the Christian Bible, you have to say that these days because there's all sorts of stuff. For the Christian Bible, the Old and New Testament, when you lose respect for this, you know, it's, oh, we're going to church. Where's my Bible? Oh, it's under the, it's under the car. I don't know where. <laughs> okay, let's go to church. When you lose respect for this, you lose perspective. Some years ago, one of the top New York Times best-selling books, certainly of our generation, written by Rick Warren, was called Purpose Driven Life. You see, it sold, sold out millions and millions of copy, copies. You see, having purpose will fuel, put fuel in your tank. And Nehemiah, because he was involved in heaven's assignment and had heaven's blessing on it, people sense that. You see, people are drawn to churches that are missional. They're missional, missional-minded, where they sense God is in the house, not just a busy church, because you can be busy doing nothing. But they sense God's here. I'm coming back. God's here. See, all through chapter 3 of Nehemiah, there are a number of different families from all walks of life that joined hands with Nehemiah to rebuild his beloved city. There were tradesmen. You can read in chapter 3 of Nehemiah. There were tradesmen and community leaders and a father and his daughters. And people built the wall in front of their house. That's very interesting. Next to him, it says in one of the, the, the scriptures in chapter 3, it says, next to him was the son of Jeshua. Next to him was the son of Zabia. Next to him was the son of Erijah. Next to him was the son of Heshdad. And then tucked away in verse 5 of chapter 3, it says this. I love the way the Holy Spirit just tucks it away, keeps it real, tucks it away in verse 5, and then the Holy Spirit says this. And next to them the tower carts repaired, but their nobles, their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. Wow. I believe the Holy Spirit penned and inserted those words on the story of Nehemiah because he wants us to realize that we don't live in a perfect ecosystem. Only Jesus is perfect theology. You waiting for perfection? Never happen. Never happen. You see, your 10% is someone else's 100%. Jesus couldn't get 100% support even on his own apostolic team. He had doubters, he had loud mouths, and even a compulsive liar. Nehemiah knew that his 10% would be someone else's 100%. He just got on with heaven's assignment. Just got on with it. See, how we build, and who we build with, rather, who we build with, is graphically described in chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Can you turn there with me, please? Chapter 4 of Nehemiah, verse 17 and 18, and I quote, Who were building on the wall, those who carried burdens, were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand, held his weapon with the other, and each of the builders had his sword strapped to his side while he built. And the man who sounded the trumpet was beside me, Nehemiah says. So Nehemiah surrounded himself with three types of people, workers, weapons, people that carried weapons, and warriors. When we arrived, when we arrived, 
in the, king, in the courts of heaven, when we arrive one day in the courts of heaven and the books are open, all we want to hear is God's fatherly voice declare, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew 25, 20, 21. Nehemiah was surrounded by faithful people. Surround yourself with people who have a heart for God's work. Don't waste your time with the wrong people in our region. Don't waste your time. I'm telling you, life, I can say that as an old man, life goes like that. My mother used to tell me, and I, when I was a kid, I'd laugh at her like, what does the old woman know? I didn't say that. She would have slapped me. Literally. Don't waste your time with the wrong people. Look for people that have a heart for God's work. Jesus encouraged us to pray for workers as the harvest is white and it's ready. Workers haven't got time to waste on the trivial. It's kingdom first attitude. Where's the cornerstone? It's there. Are we aligned? Okay, we're on track here, guys with what we're building. Look for people who are able to use their sword and shield. That's offensive and defensive weapons. People of the word. Not just those that can just quote the word. Parrots can quote the word. They can do a better job than us, just quoting. Rather look for people who are, by the grace of God, are endeavoring to walk it out on a daily basis, who can use the word as the sword of the spirit, who are discerning and insightful, like the sons of Issachar. Look for people who are warriors, spelled W-A-R-R, who are warriors, people that are not full of excuses. People that are full of excuses will wear you out. I'm actually happy. I'm not angry. Hello. It's so good to see you all this morning. I'm trying to. I'm trying to save you a lot of heartache and laugh. Look for people who are warriors. People not full of excuses. People who are not quick to make promises and declarations they can never fulfil. People that know how to pray, they are real warriors. People who don't have to be taken by the hand into Ezekiel's river. Ezekiel 47, yet Ezekiel, the, someone, doesn't say who, I say probably Jesus himself. He turns up and he takes the prophet into the water, into the river, Ezekiel 47. And he went ankle, knee deep, waist deep. Had to be held by the hand. But then in Revelation 22, verse 1, we see that John is shown the river, which speaks of God's presence. He's shown the river, not taken by the hand. Old covenant, you had to be led. Get on with it. New covenant, because it's a covenant of grace, you're shown. By grace are we saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. You're shown. Not pushed. Not pushed. You get people into the so-called kingdom by fear-mongering. I'm telling you, their, their salvation won't last long. Unless it's by the breath of heaven itself, unless God's breathed over them. By grace you are saved, not fear-mongering. Grace. Unless the Father call you, Jesus said, you're none of mine. That's scary. We're going to land this. They shown the river in Revelation 22. In other words, your call. Oh, Prayer meeting, 7 o'clock in the morning. I've got a lot of kids. Um, well, it depends who's the, who's the cornerstone. If it's little Johnny, it's little Sarah, she's the cornerstone. Your life is 
everything's around the grandkids and the kids. Well, you know who's become the cornerstone? Little Lucy, little Lucy. I know this is, this is, a, this is a sacred cow. Jeez, so glad there's no stones in the church because I'll get... Folk, Jesus is coming back for mature bride. He's coming back for mature bride. You show in the river, up to you. We're not going to text you and say, oh, please, please, we ain't got two prayer meetings. Please. No, up to you. Up to you. And because they were warriors, they enter into the river on their own initiative. You see, when you jump in on your own initiative, that's a God thing. When you push, you go, yeah, you know what? I'm bailing. I am out. Yeah, because you're pushed. To the, it's not up there, to the self-satisfied, the self-satisfied loathe that which is sweet. They loathe the honeycomb. But to the hungry, even bitter things are sweet. When someone stands behind this pulpit and preaches, you think, yeah, it was, yeah, man, if we had to hold up a placard, it would have been four out of ten. You know what? You go home and you sit around and you have your, your, your lunch with your beautiful family and someone says, Mom, Dad, what about when so-and-so said that? And you go, wow, yeah, that's true. Yeah, you're right. See, even the bit, when you're hungry, even the bitter things are sweet. See, warriors can read the room. They're familiar with God's voice. They have a trumpet in hand ready to blow it out over Zion to rally the troops. Warriors are ministry fit. Warriors are people who refuse to get off the wall as they have kingdom lenses that they evaluate life through. Not the last church you went to. Not the last church you went to. Don't measure everything by the last church. Measure everything by the word. One person said that's right. Can we stand, please? Let me land this by quoting Paul the Apostle. What an incredible guy. Lost his head for the gospel. You, you and I lose a bit of time. Go, eh, I don't know. Got other stuff on. Paul lost his head. He says in Ephesians 4.16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which, here it comes, Every part, every part, every part does its share. It causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. <clears throat> build anything, we build together. Nehemiah finished the wall in 52 days, and because, because he built a team where each part did its share. His team, like Jesus' team, wasn't perfect, but despite all the challenges he faced, because people had a mind to work, he finished his God-given assignment. What will your epitaph, what will they write on your grave, gravestone when you pass one day? I'll read you Paul's. It's found in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Folk, all around us, in all of our towns that we represent, people's walls are broken. Their gates are burnt with fire. May God bless you. May he turn his face towards you. 
May he answer all your petitions. May he be your real God and watch your back. May he be your new one that makes your heart glad. May he give you oil that makes your face shine again. May he watch your coming and going and bless your week ahead. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen.